Shopping for motherboards is never easy. There's so many to choose from, different form factors, different chipsets, different manufacturers, and different features. It can get a little overwhelming, especially due to how many are available. But have no fear. In this video, I'll be showing just which one you should get and help you pick the motherboard that fits your needs. While the motherboard may not be the most expensive part of every build, it is definitely the most important. It is where everything else fits in, CPU, graphics card, RAM, etc, etc. So when you buy a motherboard, make sure you get one that fits what you need and has the features that you want. First, I'm going to talk about form factors. There's mini ITX, micro ATX, and ATX and extended ATX. Now these are the four most common form factors you'll come across when it comes to motherboard. And each of these will fit accordingly to the case. So you can't fit an ATX motherboard in a micro ATX case or a smaller one such as a mini ITX case. However, you can fit a smaller motherboard in a bigger case. Now, personally, I recommend you get the biggest motherboard you can fit inside your case because generally speaking, smaller motherboards are more expensive and or have less features. And if you can fit an ATX motherboard, there really is no sense trying to buy a smaller micro ATX board. It'll just look bad, you have a lot of empty space, and you'll miss out on a lot of features. The next thing is the chipset. Now for LG1151, there are a couple of chipsets. The most basic one is H110M, and then there's the B150, there is the H170, and then there is the Z170, and also the C232. Now each of these chipsets are designed for different purposes. The H110 is designed to be the ultra low budget chipset that really doesn't come with anything fancy such as overclocking, SLI, M.2, most of them won't have that. A USB 3.1 is a hit or miss, most of them won't have it. It's just the most basic motherboard you can get for an ultra budget build. Let's say you're building a HTPC or a very, very low budget PC, H110M is the way to go. H110M will have at least four SATA connectors so you can fit at least four storage devices in it. I would recommend getting the H110M if you are getting a very, very low budget build. Anything with an i3 or lower, there is no need to go above the H110. Even for i5s, you can stick with the H110 if you're not planning to overclock. The B150 is a step up from the H110. It offers other features like more slots of RAM, whereas B150 has four slots of RAM, the H110 only has two. The B150 can also offer such features like USB 3.1, an M.2 slot, as well as a couple extra PCI Express times one or PCI slots on the motherboard. Most H110M motherboards will only have a full length PCI Express slot and maybe one or two PCI Express times one slots. Now I personally can't really recommend the B150 for most people. I feel like it's too niche of a price range. Uh, for about $20 more, you can get a very, very full feature Z170 that also allows overclocking. And if you're looking for bare bones, you're better off with the H110. Now, there are several situations where I do think the B150 may be useful if you're building a PC for non-gaming related. An example is if you're building a NAS where you want more than four SATA connectors for your storage arrays, then a B150 board with up to six SATA connectors can make sense. Next up is the H170. Now the H170 is essentially a Z170 without overclocking capabilities. It's the same size and often will have the exact same features. Now I recommend the H170 if you're not looking to overclock, if you're running an i3-6100 or an i5-6400, anything that's non-K, you're not gonna be able to overclock it anyways unless you modify the BIOS and do base clock overclocking, which I don't recommend because it causes a lot of problems. The Z170 is about $10 more expensive on average. There are times where the Z170 and the H170 cost essentially the same. And for that reason, I really don't recommend the H170 unless you're absolutely sure you're not at all into overclocking. And that's the only situation where I recommend an H170. In that case, you can save $10 or maybe $20 at most off of a similar Z170 motherboard by going with the H170. And finally, we have the Z170 motherboards. Now the Z170 motherboards will support overclocking using base clock or using the multiplier method if you have an unlocked processor. And some Z170 motherboards will support SLI and Crossfire. Now SLI and Crossfire is something you wanna consider about. If you do plan on Crossfire or SLI, you do need to get a Z170 motherboard that supports it. Not all of them will support it. You want to have, for SLI, at least two PCI Express slots that can run at both times eight speeds. And I would recommend the same for Crossfire, although there are motherboards that only have a PCI Express full length times 16, as well as a full length times four, and they say that it's Crossfire compatible. Personally, I recommend getting at least two times eight 
PCI Express slots for Crossfire, even though it's technically not required, just because you'll be limited by the bandwidth the PCI Express slots in certain scenarios. And especially if more and more powerful cards coming out, you'll be sure to want to have at least eight times speeds. And finally, the chipset that few mentioned is C232. This is mostly for Xeon support. If you're running for a server, for example, then get a Xeon and a C232. They're probably better because Xeons are lower clock speed individually, but have more cores and threads. So you have a better overall performance in very well multi-threaded tasks, such as server-related tasks. However, these are very, very terrible for gaming because of their low individual single core clocks. And I don't recommend picking up a Xeon for gaming unless you know what you're doing. Now let's talk about the individual features more specifically on the motherboard themselves. We'll be starting off with PCI and PCI Express slots. Now these are the slots you will see on the motherboard. They can be anywhere from very small, the 1X to the full length 16X slots. Now the full length ones are mostly meant for graphics cards or SSDs that are PCI Express compatible. All motherboards that are Skylake, uh, doesn't matter if it's H110M or doesn't matter if it's Z170, will have at least one full length that is PCI Express times 16 slot that is compatible for a graphics card. So you don't need to worry about one that supports graphics card, all of them will support it. However, if you're looking to have a Wi-Fi adapter, anything else that requires PCI Express connection, then you make sure you have the appropriate slots, whether it's 1X or for 16X for what you need. Now, most Wi-Fi adapters are 1X. You don't really need anything more than a very small PCI Express slot for your Wi-Fi adapter and you usually only need one. Now, one thing you do wanna be careful about is some other boards will have the 1X slots beneath, directly underneath the PCI Express full length slots. And most graphics card nowadays are two slot, which means uh, your graphics card will block whatever slot is directly below it. So if you're buying a motherboard and you have a Wi-Fi card that you wanna put in and it only has one PCI Express slot that's directly under the full length one, no, it's gonna be blocked by your graphics card and you can't really use it. So make sure when you buy a motherboard, it has an accessible PCI Express slot for your Wi-Fi card. Usually good motherboards will put their PCI Express times one slot above the PCI Express times 16 slots so that it won't be blocking it. Now, PCI slots are a bit more old. There are not a lot of new technology that really requires PCI. The closest thing you would need is probably a sound card. For example, you have like an Audigy sound card from a couple of years ago, and you want to use it over the onboard motherboard sound, which have been pretty good recently. Uh, then you need a PCI slot, not a PCIe slot. And a PCI slot basically looks like a PCI Express times 16 slot, but backwards. You flip that around. Some motherboards will have them. Some will have two. Some will have three, which I think is a bit of an overkill. These are being phased out. And honestly, I wouldn't recommend buying like a Wi-Fi card that uses PCI because these are not going to be supported in the future. And there are already motherboards that don't have PCI slots. So make sure if you want a sound card, pick a motherboard that has a PCI slot. Okay, enough about old technology. Let's move on to newer tech, such as the M.2 slot. Now, M.2 is a newer feature, and there are a couple generations, mostly M.2 Generation 2 and M.2 Generation 3, also known as M.2 Socket 2 or Socket 3. M.2 Socket 3 is sometimes known as Ultra M.2, depending on the motherboard manufacturer. They mean the same thing. You want the fastest current one because that's the one that supports NVMe SSDs. That's right, NVMe SSDs fit into the M.2 socket and can give up to 32 gigabit per second bandwidth, which is about four gigabyte per second uh, read and write speeds, which is incredibly fast. Now, the fastest current at M.2 SSD is the Samsung 950 Pro, and it can use up to about 2.5 gigabytes of that bandwidth, which comes actually quite close to the full 32 gigabit bandwidth and is definitely more than what the normal SATA 6 gigabit per second can handle. So if you want to have an ultra fast SSD such as a boot device, then make sure you pick a motherboard that has an M.2 slot and make sure it is M.2 generation three or ultra M.2 for the full 32 gigabit per second bandwidth. Speaking of SSDs, let's talk about SATA SSDs or other SATA devices. Now, SATA is serial ATA and it's most common in storage device on the motherboard. It connects your SSDs, your hard drives, and your optical drives if you're running it. Now, most motherboards that are on Intel's LJ1151 chipset will have at least four SATA connectors. Now, that's enough for up to four of either SSD, optical drives, or hard drives. If you want more, you need to get something better than the H110M, a Z170, usually has at least six. 
Now, SATA have speed limits of 6 gigabit per second, which is fast enough for most SATA SSDs. Most SATA SSDs have a max read and write around 500 to 550 megabytes per second, which is about 4 gigabits per second, which is still less than 6 gigabit per second on the SATA. Now, motherboard manufacturers are starting to realize that very soon we're going to get SATA SSDs that exceed the 6 gigabit per second bandwidth that SATA 3 provides. So they've created this new SATA Express connector that's basically the step up from SATA 3. It's still backwards compatible. You can plug something like SATA 3 into SATA Express, but SATA Express allows for faster transfer speeds up to 10 gigabit per second. So if you plan on getting the newest SATA SSD in the future that can support up to 10 gigabit per second speeds, then maybe SATA Express is something that you're better off investing in. Personally, I think that SATA Express's use is very, very limited. I think in the future, the faster SSDs will all follow the M.2 NVMe format, and M.2 is probably more useful than SATA Express. That being said, I could be wrong, and SATA SSDs are a lot cheaper, so maybe if you want cheap storage, but also kind of fast, then go for SATA Express. Next, I'm going to talk about onboard USB connectors. Onboard USB connectors are not the rear I.O. connectors. The onboard USB connectors are what your case plugs into on your motherboard for its front I.O. And most motherboards will have at least a USB 2 connector. Um, most motherboards will have a USB 3.0 onboard USB connector. Some motherboards will have an onboard USB 3.1 connector. And I'll explain all these later, but you need to know that if you're going to get a motherboard with a USB 3.1 or 3.0, you need to pick a case that supports these connectors. If your motherboard has support for onboard USB 3.0 or 3.1 and your case does not support it, then it's essentially wasted because your case can't make use of the onboard USBs. Okay, let's talk about rear I.O. connectors. Rear I.O. is the most common input output for the motherboard and all motherboards have at least two USB 2.0 and a PS2 usually together. Most motherboards will have some sort of video out, although there are motherboards that don't have the video out. You have to be careful when looking at it. They're usually the cheaper ones, but most motherboards will have some sort of video out. That's for the integrated graphics on your CPU. Some will support VGA, some will support DVI, some will support HDMI. Make sure it supports whatever your monitor needs, basically. Now, most motherboards will have additional connectors such as Ethernet. In fact, I think all motherboards have an Ethernet that's a gigabit speed connector on the rear I.O. Some have USB 3.0 connectors. Those are usually in blue. The USB 2.0 are usually black or uncolored, sometimes yellow, but I don't really like yellow. The USB 3.0s are most of the time in blue. I think most motherboards will have at least two. And then some motherboards will have USB 3.1 which is in red or purple, and USB 3.1 Type-C, which is a different connector, but also using 3.1 speeds. Now, if you care about 3.1, then you might want to pick a motherboard that supports it. USB 3.1 is 10 gigabit per second transfer speed, whereas USB 3.0 is only 5 gigabit per second transfer speeds. Now, what really needs that much bandwidth? The only thing that can come to my top of my head is maybe an external SSD. I know Samsung makes a USB 3.1 external SSD uh, that can be used for large transfer of a lot of data from one machine to another at very, very high speeds at about 500 megabytes per second. So you make sure you have a USB 3.1 for that uh, if you're going to be using it. As for many other things, mouse and keyboard obviously don't need even USB 3 speed. Most of them are fine USB 2. Uh, a USB flash drive may use USB 3.0, but I don't think it will use 3.1 yet. For the most part, 3.1's usefulness is not that pronounced as of yet, but in the future, especially with type C, it could be useful. So that might be something you want to invest into. Depends on person. Now, just a quick note here. Some motherboard manufacturers will refer to their USB 3.0 as USB 3.1 Gen 1. These are essentially the same thing. Do not get fooled into this. Uh, if, you see, if you see USB 3.1, and you want to make sure it has a full 10 gigabit per second, uh, make sure it's talking about USB 3.1 Gen 2. And if you're not sure, go down to the details page or even contact the motherboard manufacturer or through the website. Make sure you get the right one because I know MSI, for example, advertises their motherboards as you being USB 3.1, when in reality, a lot of them are just USB 3.1 Gen 1 connectors, which are the same speed as USB 3.0. So sometimes you might get tricked by that. Just something to be looking out for. Some higher end motherboards will have onboard Wi-Fi and that goes where the normal I.O. would be. It's built in Wi-Fi and it's fairly good. Not all motherboards will have this. In fact, most motherboards will not have onboard Wi-Fi. You usually have to pay a premium for it. If you do have onboard Wi-Fi, make sure you put the antennas in the right positions and set that up accordingly because once you put it in the case, it becomes very, very difficult to set up.
This is especially valuable for mini ITX motherboards. Uh, a lot of them will have onboard Wi-Fi just because mini ITX motherboards usually will not have enough room for an external Wi-Fi adapter that's not USB based. So if you're looking into a mini ITX build and you want a Wi-Fi adapter, chances are you're gonna have to get a motherboard that supports onboard Wi-Fi. And that usually costs you a bit extra, but that's what you pay for mini ITX. And that's why, again, I recommend getting the biggest possible motherboard you can fit into your case because otherwise you'll have to pay extra for features and you really don't want to be doing that. And finally, we have uh, miscellaneous stuff, in my opinion at least, such as onboard audio chips. Some other boards will have poorer audio qualities than others. Obviously, you can get an external DAC or digital to analog converter and not really care about the motherboard's onboard audio. But if you are going to be using a pair of Sennheiser HD 598s, then you might want to consider getting a motherboard with a higher quality onboard audio chipset. And the newest one, I believe, is the Realtek ALC 1150. The next step down, I think, is the ALC 892. Anything worse than 892, I don't recommend if you care about high quality audio with headsets. Some other miscellaneous details include the color, the style, whether or not it has heat spreaders. Some other boards, higher quality ones that are very, very expensive, will have everything entire PCB that's going to be shielded so you don't accidentally damage it. The higher end motherboards will have extreme amount of detail. Some will have six USB 3.1 connectors on the rear I.O. Uh, really, you're going to put six USB 3.1 devices. So in summary, I recommend you getting an idea of what you want your PC to look like, what features you want. Do you want an NVMe SSD? Do you want USB 3.1 type A or type C support? Do you want integrated Wi-Fi? Are you going to be using a Wi-Fi adapter? Are you going to be running Crossfire or SLI? Are you going to be overclocking your CPU? Are you going to be listening to high quality music with your expensive headset? All of these things are things you need to consider and I can't really tell you what to buy. But once you consider all these things, then hopefully you can use that knowledge to pick out what you need and find a decent motherboard at a decent price that has all the features you want because that's at the end of the day what you want to do. You want to find the cheapest motherboard that has all the features that you want and go with that. That sums it up for this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to my channel. If you didn't, be sure to leave a dislike and tell me in the comment section below why. And as always, thank you for watching and have a great day.